morning, everyone. It's good to see you all here. And uh, thank you, Alex, for uh, subbing for me last week. Y'all did a great job. I heard the video, and it was great. And so I want to thank you. I uh, had a great time in New Mexico. And it's good to be in God's house. Uh, enjoy being here. And uh, pray that uh, you will be blessed as you uh, participate in worship. And we pray also for those that might be watching on video. We pray also God's richest blessing upon your life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we begin our time together. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this day you've given us, Lord. Thank you for those that are here. We ask that you would bless the homes they come from. And Father, we pray, Lord, that this experience of worship would draw us closer to you, Lord. And that we will, as we leave this place, we will be uh, glad that we were in your house. Thank you, Lord, for all your blessings. Thank you for your protection. We pray for those that are watching through video. We pray your blessings and your favor upon them as well. All these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Well, at this time, I'm going to ask Alex to come and, and his uh, family to come lead us in a time of worship and praise unto the Lord. Well, good morning. We'd like to welcome everybody, obviously, to the Lord's house. This is my favorite part of uh, coming to worship is the singing. It has been since I was eight years old, and I never thought that when I was eight years old and I started playing and participating in a Spanish church and playing in there, that I would be one day up here with my kids and uh, celebrating the Lord's name and worshiping the Lord's name. So uh, let's go together in, the, in worship to Him. You were the word at the beginning.
Praise God. Praise God. Today we'll be reading from 1 Peter 2, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, rid yourself of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Amen. Now, we're going to start our time together. I'm going to show you, it's like a one minute commercial over here to my right and uh, it comes from a campaign that started I guess about 20 years ago and uh, it's a series of commercials uh, but I'm just going to show you one the last one minute and uh, it's uh, from that campaign got milk okay segment that uh, you saw in that commercial is from actress uh, Salma Hayek where she plays the role of a housewife who's desperate, very desperate to find milk. Now the God Milk commercial or the God Milk campaign because it had several different uh, videos but that campaign featured in various commercials was one of the most successful marketing campaigns ever. And of course, uh, the trademark of all those videos, you saw in a lot of video clips, there were consumers who had a white mustache after drinking a glass of milk. Now, milk is a very complete drink that contains many nutrients. It is interesting that cows give more milk when they are named. If you assign a name to each cow, they tend, for some reason, to give more milk. And also, if you play music while the cows are being milk, they also will uh, give you more milk. But normally, a dairy cow yields about eight gallons of milk or 128 glasses of milk. Now, drinking milk has many benefits, including eliminating heartburn, raising the body's immune defense, giving you energy, reducing stress, helping you to lose weight, reducing the risk of cancer, and of course strengthening, because of the calcium in it, strengthening your muscles, your teeth, and your bones. Now it says in this passage that we are to desire the spiritual milk, that is the Word of God, just like a baby wants it. But this passage also talks about eating in general because it talks about the experience of knowing God as having like a gourmet experience of spiritual delights. Because it says in that passage that we just got through reading, it said, if now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. So I can explain that passage this way. Let's suppose that you're a university student who lives alone and you still haven't found that better half to cook you all your favorite dishes. So what happens is you don't, you don't have the experience or you don't have time to cook, uh, you don't have somebody to cook for you or whatever, but basically you lived on canned food, 
TV dinners uh, that you heat in the microwave, broths, soups that come in a package, or Raymond noodles. In my opinion, Raymond noodles taste horrible. They're gross, I think. They uh, <clears throat> taste awful, but I have a grandson. Olivia, you might recall that Jackson, uh, he loves uh, Raymond noodles. I don't know why, but he likes them. So what happens is uh, you're a single guy, and uh, you're not used to eating fresh, fine food. But let's say that one day I invite you to my house, and my wife prepares a meal for you. By the way, my wife is a great cook. And I found out uh, the other day that also Carmen is a great cook also. But let's say that she prepares a meal for you with all, all the ingredients, uh, all fresh ingredients, rice, beans. And her specialty is chile rellenos. And she stuffs those, by the way, I love the way those poblano peppers smell when you roast them. That, that is just an awesome smell. That's, I mean, just, uh, I love, I could smell those uh, Orlando pepper, peppers all day. Uh, they ought to make a candle out of, that, that would be a project for somebody. To make a, a candle with the chile relleno uh, aroma, that would be awesome. But anyway, my wife, uh, she stuffs those chile rellenos with all kinds of delicious ingredients. So you're a single guy, invite you to the house, you're used to eating all this, uh, you know, instant food. And uh, my wife serves you my favorite, which is my favorite dish of chile rellenos. And I'm sure that after that eating experience, after eating that uh, full course meal of rice, beans, and chile rellenos, you will say, you know what, all this time, I've been eating this, this food that's, you know, you put it in the microwave, and there it is. But now I'm eating something that's really awesome, and I didn't know what I was missing. And uh, that's the way, in my opinion, that's the way a sinner is. He's accustomed to crumbs. He's accustomed to a lousy diet of the vices of this world. And he's uh, accustomed to eating food that will never satisfy him. So. He also drinks from the bitter gulps of the misery of this world. But one day, this sinner comes to the spring that gushes to eternal life. A spring that quenches his thirst forever. One day he comes to the Lord, and he comes to taste that the Lord is indeed good. And he begins to savor his love, his kindness, his fellowship, his communion with him. He comes and sits at the Lord's table and begins feasting on all kinds of delicacies and spiritual delights. Then he will say, like the single guy that we might invite to this house, he will say, well, I didn't know what I was missing. Before I was on a lousy diet of leftovers, rotten and spoiled food, but now I enjoy the richest spiritual food and what has happened is that you have an experience where your palate is, in other words, the desire of your palate is, is changed. And now you want nothing but the best in a culinary experience of rich spiritual food. So that's what's coming to the Lord looks like. You, you come to know the Lord. You come to taste that the Lord is good. How many of you have tasted the Lord? How many of you have tasted God's sweet love. How many have tasted the presence and the glory of God? It says here in this passage, if you like the Lord's kindness, you will never return to the spoiled and rotten food that the devil offered to you in the past. Because now we know our, our palate is now accustomed, our taste buds are now accustomed to eating a plate of exquisite spiritual food. So now the problem is that uh, sometimes you lose your appetite for the 
main course because we fill up on junk food. Everybody say the word junk food? Junk food. It's not good for you. Junk food can fill you up, but it will never satisfy you. As a matter of fact, it can even poison you, slowly by slowly. So this is the way it can happen. Let's, ass let's assume, let's stay with Mexican food for now. Let's assume you go to a restaurant and you order a plate of either chicken enchiladas or spinach enchiladas uh, accompanied with beans and rice. Now that, that, that is the main course that you're going to get, okay? Chicken enchiladas, rice and beans. But before they bring you that plate, the waiter brings you a Coke, which in my opinion is junk food because it has 10 to 12 teaspoons of sugar. So the waiter also brings you some chips and some, uh, also some salsa. And so you start gulping on that Coke, you start eating the, the chips and the salsa. And before you know it, you empty all the contents of that basket that the waiter brought you. And your stomach is now full of what? Of junk food. It's full of the soda, the Coke. It's full of the chips and the salsa. And so when they bring you the main course, you lose your appetite. Guess what? You're not hungry anymore. And so they bring you those three enchiladas. They look yummy. They're with a sour cream on them. And, you know. But you've lost your appetite because you filled up on that Coke. You know, they bring you a big old glass of Coke and those chips and those salsa. And when the main course comes, you only eat one enchilada. And at the end, you say, well, can you give me a bag so I can take the rest of it home? Now, this is what the Word of God says. The Word of God says that there are certain types of junk food. Say junk food again. Junk food, okay. That we should eliminate from our diet. And Peter talks about them here. He says, therefore, rid yourself of what? Malice. That's one of them. Uh, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. So first of all, here is the junk food that we need to eliminate because it, these are appetite killers. They will kill your appetite for the things of God. First of all, there is malice. This refers to the fact that a person has bad desires and they're internalized. And he, he or she spends the majority of their time calculating or scheming in their mind how they can harm another person. Now, it's interesting that Peter puts this type of uh, junk food at the very top. I mean, because malice is, is uh, it can surely rob you of your appetite for the things of God. And it's interesting that all these uh, five things that are mentioned, they have to do with our relationships with other people. In other words, they have to do with the horizontal relationship with people because when we don't get along with people, that affects our vertical relationship with God. So, you have malice, you have deceit. Deceit is uh, something that Peter knows very well about. Because in the original, it is a word that, he, that is used for fooling a fish with bait. Uh, last time I went fishing, uh, I went down there to the Gulf, and, and we fooled a lot of fish. My son and I, we went, and we fooled about 50 fish that we caught. Uh, and we fooled them with shrimp. They thought they were getting a, a bite of shrimp, but you know, had a hook on it. So you put a bait on a hook and the fish swallows it and it gets hooked. So how does it play out in our relationship with other people? Well, deception is used to manipulate people and to get what you want. 
So I can spend all day talking to you about all the different kinds of manipulative tools that people use to get their way. There's a lot of them. I'm just going to mention a few. People, first of all, manipulate through shouting. Uh, they get in a shouting match with you, see who yells the loudest. They, uh, if they're bigger than you, they threaten you with physical force. They also punish you with silence. Also, they ignore you. Also, the manipulator looks for weaknesses, and he tries to play the divide and conquer strategies. Manipulators are very good for dividing family members, so they, so they, that he can be in a position of strength, and that he can take advantage because they play the divide and conquer strategy. He can also be very dramatic. I mean, manipulators, oh my God, they are so dramatic. There's so much drama in their lives. Uh, and the reason they're very dramatic is uh, they want you to feel pity for them. Uh, and finally, they're very good at putting words in your mouth. I mean, even, even if you haven't said something, they say, well, you, you said you were going to do this, or you promised me that. And that's the manipulator. Now, we're to eliminate deceit from our menu. I mean, those are, that's, that's junk food. So you have malice, you have deceit. And then uh, he also mentions hypocrisy. Now, this word comes from the Greek theater where actors would put on different masks. In other words, it would be the same person, but all he would do is he would just put a, a different mask to play a different role. And so what happens is that hypocrisy manifests itself in the Christian life when you put on a saint's mask in church. You're here in church, you put on a your church mask, and then when you get out, you put on your worldly mask, the mask of the world. Now, there's, you see you see the inconsistency there? Here, you put on the same mask, as soon as you leave, you put on a different mask. Well, uh, praise God if you can. I mean, if the shoe fits, you will wear it. But what God wants you to do is to be the same here in church, and the same when you leave. God does not want you to take different roles and put on different masks. You know, when I was looking at this uh, word hypocrisy, which talks about a person that puts on different roles, it's like a chameleon that changes according to the environment. It reminded, it reminded me of a man that uh, he never prepared for all these uh, careers and vocations and occupations of life, and yet he performed it. And this man's name was Ferdinand de Mara. Ferdinand de Mara, who forged credentials and diplomas for many titles. So in his uh, life, he was a, a monk. One time, at one time in his life, when he was real young, as a matter of fact, he became a monk. Uh, a Benedictine monk. And uh, he was also a civil engineer. He also uh, forged some credentials to become the director of a zoo. He was a psychologist also. He was a, an attorney, a lawyer. He was a professor at a university in Pennsylvania. He became the warden of a prison here, in, right here in Texas. And he was also a, a medical surgeon. Somehow he, you know, said he had all these titles and degrees, and, and he was accepted in the army as a medical surgeon in uh, in the Korean conflict. And so it's really really interesting because one time they they brought him sixteen soldiers, and and they all needed to be operated on, all sixteen of them, and they all needed some kind of operation. And so he tells the nurse, of course, he was a very confident person, uh, a guy that he exuded like he knew everything. And he told the nurses, okay, there's 16 soldiers that need operations. He said, okay, uh, nurses, y'all get them prepped up, get them ready for me. And so he went in, in the back, he hid in one of the rooms, and he was reading a manual um, on how to perform these operations because uh, obviously he didn't know how to operate on them. And uh, it was uh, just a miraculous thing that all of them, none of them died 
and all of them survived. But of course, he didn't know what he was doing, and, and I wouldn't want to go to one of those kind of doctors. But God wants us uh, to play only one role, and that role is to be a child of God who at all times and in all places shines with a testimony that brings glory to him. Can I, can I get an amen to that? And uh, then you have envy. So envy is a desire to have what another person has. It is envy, for example, that the other person has a late model car, or he has a nice, large brick home, a house, a mansion. And you say, well, I want that. Uh, now, envy is also wishing badly, wishing misfortune on a person and laughing, laughing when that person uh, falls into some kind of uh, difficulty. So envy. Then you have the, the last one, which is slander. That is to gossip. And it, you notice that it says all kinds of slander. Well, there's different kinds of slander. You have mockery, you have sarcasm. But in all situations, whenever you slander, whenever you gossip, you, you speak ill of someone who is not there to defend himself. So there are some who say, ha, ha, ha. Uh, it was discovered that the boss slept with the secretary and the wife found out and she's full of rage and she's waiting for him to come home so she can skin him alive. Well, when you, when you say that to somebody else, that's gossip. And what we should do in that case is just pray for that couple. So Peter tells us that there are five attitudes. There are five types of junk food that we shouldn't have in our menu. And let me just repeat it once again. They're malice, they're deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander because they're, they rob us of our appetite for the main course. So what is the diet of a believer? Well. It's spiritual meal. A newborn believer is compared to a baby who has a desire for milk. Now, uh, we have some ladies here in uh, our audience, and you, you know about babies. You know about the, the fact that they confuse the nights and the days. They wake up at night when we're sleeping, and they disturb our sleep because they want to drink milk at all hours of the day. So a baby cannot speak. So what does he do? What does the baby do? He can't speak. So what does he do? He cries. Now, as far as my experience, I, I, I was born in a house, not in a hospital. And according to what my mother told me, she gave me rice mixed with water, and that was my milk. And she also uh, gave me some bean, no uh, uh, caldo, the soup of the beans. She also gave that to me in a bottle. But in our family, my wife and I, we had four children, and we gave them all milk. So a baby becomes hysterical when uh, you don't give him milk. He starts crying, he wants milk. And the baby doesn't care. I mean, when a baby is crying for, for milk, he doesn't care. I mean, you could tell a, a baby, okay, well, shut up already. Uh, you know, you, you see that crib where you're laying? I spent hundreds of dollars on that crib. It's a beautiful crib. It was the best crib they had at uh, Baby R's. Um, the baby doesn't care how much money you spend on that crib. He, uh, he doesn't care about how expensive that outfit that he is wearing. Or the toy that rattles. He's not interested. He's not interested in the expensive crib. He's not interested in that nice outfit that he's wearing. He's not interested in a toy that rattles. He's interested in only one thing. What is it? Milk. The only thing that will please him will be milk. And he won't quit crying until you give him 
a bottle of milk. Now, the baby cries because he wants milk. But to this day, I mean, I've been in the ministry 50 years, 50 plus years, and I've never seen a believer cry because he hasn't read the Word of God. Now, a baby cries because he wants milk, but I, I've never seen a believer cry, oh my God, you know, start crying just because you haven't read the Word of God. Yet they cry and they grumble whenever they lose their iPhone. Well, uh, praise God if you can. So we should desire as a newborn children the spiritual milk. Now that spiritual milk, in my opinion, is, is not just the word, but it includes a lot of things. It includes the desire to have communion with God, the desire to pray, the desire to be in God's house, the desire to listen to Christian music that exalts the name of God. So, it is a desire to focus on spiritual things. Narco soap operas on TV, listening to Los Tigres del Norte or some punk rocker, that's not going to promote, that's not going to advance your spiritual life. You see, it says that this milk, it describes it as spiritual. So it's only the spiritual that's going to build us up. You cannot be fed in your, your spirit cannot be fed with the things of this world. And now it says uh, also that it's better to study the word itself. Uh, the pure milk. Uh, you know, it's good to hear what a preacher has to say about a text, but that's not the pure word. That's that's the word mixed with his or her thoughts. So it's, it's best just to, to read the pure word of God without mixing it with what other people say. In, in my desk, uh, Olivia can attest to that, I have five or six Bibles, and they're all different versions. And one of my delights is just reading the word of God and uh, reading it in different versions. So I have something for you. Instead of Facebook, get your face in the book. We also see a thing, uh, another thing that's mentioned about the spiritual food. It makes us grow. The Word of God makes us grow. How many of you want to grow in the Lord? Here we see that salvation is something that comes incrementally and gradually. That is to say, the Lord, look, the Lord saved you in the, in the past tense. You were saved when you came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. But He is also saving you in the present tense. He's saving you from a lot of uh, your defects in character. He wants you to be more like Jesus. And he's going to save you in the future tense whenever you go to heaven and your body is transformed into a glorified spiritual body. So, well, listen to this. You start with milk, but you don't stay with milk. The baby begins with milk, but after a few months, what is he giving? He's giving some oatmeal. Uh, then he's uh, giving uh, special baby food that comes in jars. It's a little bit more solid. And then finally, he progresses to the, just the food that we all eat. The mother or the father cut it all up. If they're eating a, like a piece of steak or vegetable, they cut it up and, they, and that's what the baby uh, or the child, as he grows up, will start eating. But it started with milk, which is uh, very essential for a newborn baby. So now my, my wife, she teaches uh, pre-K. These are children that are four years old. And I visited her classroom many times, and I have never, to this day, I, you know, she's been teaching for 
I don't know, 47 years? And I, I have never seen a pre-K, a four-year-old child, take out a bottle of milk for his lunch. Why? Because they've outgrown that. Uh, they don't need uh, milk anymore. Now there's a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 to 3, it says, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 to 3. It says, Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly. As mere infants in Christ, I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. See, there's some people. You try to give them solid food. You try to give them a spiritual snake, but they're, they're not ready for it. Uh, they can't handle it. Indeed, you are not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, you are not worldly. Are you not acting like mere humans? What we see in this passage, passage is that there are believers who are still in the kindergarten department. They have years in the Lord. They've been Christians for many years. And they are still spiritual midgets. So when Paul came to teach him, he tried, to, he, he tried to give them some solid food, but they couldn't handle it. I mean, they couldn't digest that because they were still, they, they still had a worldly mindset. They were still carnal, or as the NIV says in Spanish, inmaduros, they were still immature. And of course, you see that they're the immature believer is described as a jealous person and one who likes to start quarrels or fights. Well, there again, praise the Lord if you can. So I pity the pastor. I mean, I really feel sorry for pastors who have a church full of kindergartners, a church full of children. They're all crying and complaining and wanting the pastor to tend to them change their diapers, and give them milk with a bottle. But on the contrary, there are brothers and sisters in the church who say, yes, brother, I know that Christ saved me. I mean, I, I know the fundamentals of the grace of God. I know what it means to be saved. Uh, I've already drank uh, enough spiritual milk, but now I want to give more into the Word. And now I want uh, a, a spiritual T-bone uh, the, the basic Christian stuff, it really doesn't satisfy me no more. I, I want something more solid. I'm ready for solid food. So one of the projects that I'd like to see continue in our church, uh, you know, we, before this COVID experience, we had a Bible Institute where you could get a, uh, a two-year degree in, in uh, some uh, basic uh, Bible and theological courses. So I'd like to get that going again. Also, we had Celebrate Recovery. I think these are two programs that help you get more into the things of God. Of course, Sunday school is also very important. We've kind of put that on hold for right now because of what's going on with, with COVID. But let me finish with this. You know, I, I once heard of a college girl that there was a certain novel that the professor assigned to her. And according to her, this this novel was the most boring novel she had ever read. But one day, there was this friend of hers that introduced her to a very handsome gentleman. And so they looked at each other, and it was, I mean, their eyes crossed past, and they looked at each other and fell in love. And uh, it so happens that they were out on a date, and she discovered that he was the author of that novel. And so that night, she went to her apartment, and she read that story. She read that book with great enthusiasm, savoring, I mean, every, every page. And you know what? She fell in love with that book. 
because she had fallen in love with the author. And so the day you fall in love with God, you're also going to love this book. Because uh, this book is just like a love letter where God tells you how much he loves you. So if you don't know the Lord, I want you to know the Lord. And it starts by you. I mean, the starting point is you placing your faith in, in, in Christ as your Lord and Savior. So I want, if you don't know the Lord, I want to pray for you that you come to know him. Because that's, that's the starting point of the Christian walk. So right now, right where you are, just join me in this prayer. If you don't know the Lord, Lord Jesus, I realize that I need you. I ask you to come into my life. Thank you for forgiving my sins and giving me the promise of eternal life. Well, we've uh, posted uh, the website and the number that you can call for prayer. And uh, thank you for joining us today. And may the Lord bless you. And we look forward to seeing you again next time.